Hello, everyone. Welcome to our June Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Committee webinar. We appreciate you tuning in and joining us this morning. Uh, my name is Samantha Gallagher, and I'm the Member Engagement Director here at the California MBA. Um, if you have not joined us previously with these webinars, we host them on a quarterly basis, and we also make sure that we record them each month or each quarter, and then upload them to our cmba.com website. So um, if you visit our DEI committee page, you'll be able to visit all the past uh, webinars and um, podcasts that we've done if you'd like to re reference them there. Um, but before we get to today's presentation, we'd like to thank our committee sponsor, PCB and Mercor, for their support of our DEI committee. Let me put slides here for a second. We've invited Charles Beatley. He is with PCB, PCB Mercor to say a few words. Charles, I'll pass it over to you. Thank you, Samantha. For more than 40 years, PCB Mercor has built a tradition of excellence in helping hundreds of clients make their customers' real estate appraisal needs happen. Licensed in all 50 states plus DC, PCV is the nation's largest block owned AMC that provides appraisal management and evaluation advisory for residential and commercial real estate. We manage valuation needs for mortgage lending, financial institutions, estate and litigation, real estate investors, and mortgage servicers. Since 1981, we've been the industry's premier appraisal management company to embrace diversity, equity, and inclusiveness with a business model that truly serves everyone. Through the diversity of our employees, we gain the benefit of looking at different ways to approach our business and has made us a stronger partner to our clients. PCV is committed to helping clients and their customers make their real estate appraisal needs happen through accountability, connectivity, and performance. Thank you. Thank you, Charles. Um, Rosalind, do you want to go ahead and take it away from here? Okay, I will take it from here. Thank you so much, Charles. We are so excited and happy to have PCRV McCor as our sponsor for our DEI committee and our Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Committee. As Samantha shared with you, does this quarterly. We welcome all that want to join our committee. You can just reach out to Samantha if any of anyone ever wants to come and help us in this effort. And I am so excited to be moderating and facilitating this webinar, which is part two of our appraisal bias and fair lending webinar for the DNI. But I wanna kind of set the backdrop if you don't mind. And I guess I should first say good morning to everyone. And so glad to have you here. And we have two very informed and dynamic presenters for you today to share with you the most updated and news and information about this area that has gotten so much intense attention from the White House to all the federal regulators as well as the state regulators across the country and the public at large. And just to kind of introduce to you before we go to our speakers about today's webinar and why we even are doing a part two. And that's because for those of you, just sit back and think for a minute. For those of you that own a home and have refinanced your home during 2020 or 2021, when the interest rates were at record lows, the banks were at 0% home interest rates were at two and 3% interest. What if you were refinancing your home, trying to take advantage as rightfully you should at two and 3% interest rate of these historically low rates? You may have been trying to pull cash out for tuition. Maybe you were trying to fund a business, whatever the case may be. But what if when the appraiser entered your home and there was something that subconsciously triggered a bias in him? And when he finished your appraisal report, that appraisal report came in thousands of dollars lower than what you thought it should be. Thousands of dollars lower. And because of that appraisal value, the lender had to deny your loan for insufficient equity. They were not able to make you the loan for the loan amount that you were seeking. So just think about how that would have made you feel if you were a family trying to secure that loan. And that is what we're talking about today. There are families that are experienced. We got a new term. I don't know who coined it, if it was the media, who was definitely taking interest in this area, called lowball appraisals. And there's a 
video that's available and you can actually access it through the California MBA's website. If you go through the DEI page, you can get you can get it there. But it's called Our America Lowball. And I'm just going to give you a brief summary of that video. And it's about black and Latino families who have had their homes appraised for up to five hundred thousand. We're talking about a half a million dollar less than expected. And race has shown to play a significant factor. According to an ABC owned television station, data analysis of more than 50 million home loans, refinance applications in predominantly black neighborhoods are nearly five times more likely to be under appraised than in white communities. The analysis also found home purchase loans in black neighborhoods are more than twice as likely to be under appraised. This particular documentary that ABC did was intended to spotlight this issue. And today, that's what we're doing. We're trying to help the industry to be informed, to be alert. And we've got Rich and Jeff here that are going to help us to do that. So with no further ado, I'm going to introduce to you these wonderful speakers that are going to bring to us this information. Take notes, listen carefully. And as Samantha said, we do record these webinars. So if you need to go back or if you need to share it with anyone in your company that's not able to participate today, then we most definitely encourage you to do that. So our first presenter is going to be Richard Adrano. Richard is the practice leader of Ballard Spara Mortgage Banking Group. He is also a member of this law firm's business and transactions, consumer financial services, and fair lending groups. He has devoted over 35 years of practice to financial services, mortgage banking, and consumer finance law. Rich advises banks, leaders, brokers, home builders, title companies, real estate professionals, and other settlement providers on regulatory compliance and transactional matters, the Federal Housing Administration on, on Federal Housing Administration issues, and administrative examinations, enforcement actions, and investigations. So Richard is definitely the man to go to if you get a knock on the door from these regulators, okay? And that may happen soon, given what's going on in the industry. And then our next speaker that's going to come right after Rich is Jeff Hogan. Jeff is an appraiser and he has over 30 years of experience as a state certified real estate appraiser. Jeff is the principal expert for all matters related to residential property appraisals and valuation solutions at Barrows, Barrows Real Estate Solutions. His responsibilities also include reviewing and analyzing real estate property valuation data and evaluating product performance, including rules modifications. Jeff was a panel speaker at the National Mortgage Bankers Conference in Nashville, as well as a guest speaker at the National Appraisal Roundtable discussing how technology can be used to help limit potential appraisal bias and the need to add diversity to the profession. Jeff is also a member of the Appraisal Foundation Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Committee and the Industry Advisory Council Task Force. Before joining Virals, Barrels, forgive me, Jeff was the Senior Review Appraiser for the Bank of California. He has held appraisal leadership roles in various large financial institutions, including Bank of America and Citigroup. And Citigroup. He he holds a bachelor's degree from Cal State Fullerton University and MBA from the University of Redlands. Jeff also holds the CRA and AIRRS designation with the Appraisal Institute. And I'm going to ask Jeff to tell me what the AIRRS is when he comes on. But I thank you both for being here. And I'm going to turn this over to Rich, who is going to bring you the much needed information about this appraisal bias issue in our industry. Thank you. 
Thank you very much, Rosalind, and good day, everyone. Uh, all of the items I'll be covering, if you want more information on it, uh, they're the subject of blog posts on our uh, Ballot Spar Consumer Finance Monitor. So you just Google Ballot Spar Consumer Finance Monitor, it'll bring you there. Uh, the appraisal tag is working for the 2023 articles. For some reason, it's not working for the articles from the fall, but you could also just search appraisal as a, in, in a separate function, and that would put up pull up all of these items we're going to cover and they have links to the original items as well so that's for convenience you can get that information uh the bureau as you know the director chopper is not shy about uh making uh, bold statements uh and uh, threats somewhat considered to the industry and in the reconsideration of value or rov becoming yet another acronym that's used in this industry uh, he addressed the need for lenders to have a very clear and robust reconsideration of value uh, policies and indicated if you don't have clear actionable information to consumers on how to raise concerns on the accuracy of appraisal, you may be violating federal law. And you must ensure that all borrowers have the opportunity to explain why they think evaluation may not be correct, that they don't think they're stuck with that appraisal and there's nothing, no sense of recourse. You do have to let them know that there is, there are avenues of recourse. And uh, while the processes don't have to be the same, although we're going to get into some uh, what guidance that I think is going to push them to be a little more uniform, uh, the process has to be non-discriminatory and available and accessible to all. Now, exactly what federal law would be violated uh, if you didn't have these policies, the, the director did not say that, uh, but we do get more in some further guidance, and let's uh, look forward at some draft guidance uh, that HUD uh, put out in the beginning of January on the next slide we could see usually what they just do is they just issue a mortgagee letter and there's the guidance this time however they sought comments and they put out a draft mortgagee letter uh, right at the beginning of the year and it had a 30-day comment period that uh, you know that, that's closed but basically what they want to do is provo provide more guidance in this area and really particularly also let borrowers know that they can initiate uh, a re reconsideration of value request. Now, one thing they want to do is collect more information on when borrowers do make requests and what the outcome of those requests are. So it's updating FHA connection for both forward and reverse mortgage loans. And we know in the HUD world, it's a heckum, you know, not the greatest uh, acronym ever, but that's what the reverse mortgage loans are in the HUD world. And so they will document, you would go in and indicate where a borrower has made a request and what the results of that request are. Now let's move on to the next slide. We can see what also uh, they did here in this area. Uh, interestingly, we've heard a lot directing at lenders, but HUD also wants to address the appraiser's obligations when an ROV is requested. And it also wants to uh, increase consumer awareness by updating the consumer's version of the appraisal value form to indicate, in fact, that there is a reconsideration of value guidance. Now, comment period closed beginning of February. We're here in June. HUD is not the swiftest moving agency on the face of the planet, but I would look uh, sometime this year to probably see some further guidance from HUD. Now let's look at other developments in this area on the next slide. Uh, this is group of federal agencies proposed reconsideration of value guidance. And it's basically here, it's the CFPB and the banking agencies jointly issued this guidance June 8th has not yet appeared in the Federal Register. When it does appear, there'll be a 60-day comment period uh, for industry to provide their input. And you know, what they do is there could be various reasons why a collateral valuation may be deficient, and that could be high or low, uh, just being deficient. It could be discrimination, errors or omissions, valuation methods that were used, assumptions, data sources, conclusions that are as I say, unreasonable, unsupported, unrealistic, or inappropriate. So they said there could be a variety of contributing factors. And a deficient valuation can present risk to both lenders and consumers. A consumer may not be able to get a loan. They may not be able to sell their home because it's appraising too low and no one could get a loan to buy it. Uh, appraise too high, they're, you know, they're, they're paying more than they perhaps should for the home uh, and lower a low valuation also uh, means higher LTV which means you may have 
more in favor of pricing on the loan with an LTV adjustment for that. Uh, for lenders, actually, you know, overvaluations could be you're, you're lending too much and you're presenting a risk. So they indicate a lot of, a lot of things can happen whether a valuation is too high or too low. So now let's move on to the next slide and see what um, a little more what they promote here. What they define it for purposes of this guidance, an oral request made by a financial institution to an appraiser or other preparer of valuation report that encompasses a request to reassess the report based on deficiencies or information that may affect the value conclusion. That's the definition they're using for purposes of this proposed guidance. And they indicate that an institution can initiate a request because of their own valuation review activities or because of a consumer complaint or inquiry that the consumer made to the loan officer or other lender representative. So really it could be triggered by the lender's own efforts or by input from the consumer. And what it concludes is consideration of comparable properties that weren't previously identified. That often is a debate where the correct properties identified really or what what the appraiser used, were they really the best comparisons? And there's where you often get the real estate agent coming in with other sales to say, no, we think you should have considered these. Uh, the property characteristics itself, uh, other information about the property that may have been incorrectly reported or not previously considered, any of those obviously could affect the valuation conclusion. And let's move on now to the next slide. And we can see that they consider financial institutions may consider and they do use the word may consider developing risk-based ROV related policies, procedures, control systems, and processes. I think once this guidance come out, it's a must and not a may, because if you don't have these policies, procedures, and systems in place and the regulator shows up at your door, that's not going to be a good conversation you're going to have. They're going to want you to have these procedures in place. And they give examples of what policies, procedures, and control systems might include. Uh, this is not everything. The blog post has more of the items here. Uh, consider as a possible resolution to a consumer complaint. Okay, they're unhappy with it. Let's ask for a reconsideration consideration evaluation. Consider whether other information or process requirements related to the consumer request to initiate, whether your requirements create unreasonable barriers or discourage consumers from requesting an ROV. Is it easy, is it convenient for the consumer to do this, or are you making it harder than it should be? Establish a process that provides for identification and management analysis and appropriate risk escalation of requests along the various business lines and from various channels and sources. And we'll look at additional points, they say, which uh, on the next slide, which you might include. And that is uh, inform the consumers. That's a big common thing we're hearing. Let the consumer know this process does exist. That's very important. And risk-based systems that get it to the appropriate business unit, particularly is it just a request for reconsideration or does it also involve a claim of discrimination? You probably want to handle that a little differently and higher escalation if that's the case standardized processes so you could be more consistent in how you handle a request for reconsideration of value. It could include guidelines on what information you need to move forward with a request and the big issue when a second appraisal could should be ordered and who pays for it. They're not suggesting that the institution has to pay for it uh, although we may see further suggestions along that line as we go forward and ensure that relevant lending and evaluation related staff including third parties if you use appraisal management company sets are trained to identify deficiencies included prohibitory, prohibited discriminatory practices through the review process. So that just came out, not in the Federal Register yet. Again, it will probably appear, some I'm guessing, sometime this month. So we're probably looking at end of August for a comment period deadline. And then my guess is maybe end of this year, early next year for finalization. Now let's move on to something similar. The federal agencies have been busy. This is the banking agencies again, the Bureau again, but also the Federal Housing Finance Agency proposed QC rules for automated valuation models. This, believe it or not, is a Dodd-Frank rule. Here in 2023, we have yet another proposed rule under Dodd-Frank. 60-day uh, comment period, it is scheduled for publication in the June 21st Federal Register. So we're looking at around August 20th for the comment deadline. I think that's a Sunday, but on regs.gov, you could upload anything at any time, 24-7. Uh, They're gonna give some time for implementation, it would be the first day of the calendar quarter that's 
at least 12 months after publication of the final rule in the Federal Register. Here's what they define as an AVM for purposes of this proposed QC rules. It's any computerized model used by mortgage originators and secondary market issuers to, to determine the value of a consumer's principal dwelling collateralizing a mortgage. This would apply whether the credit is money for consumer purposes or business purposes. So it would apply equally to both. Uh, let's look at the next slide. I'm not going to go into great detail here because it's more true quality control for AVMs, but I want to focus more on the last element on this slide. And it would apply to the use by a mortgage originator, which they define in the guidance, or a secondary market issue, which would they define in the guidance, in determining the value of a collateral in connection with making a credit decision, that is a defined term in the guidance, or a covered securitization determination, also a defined term. One of the covered securitization determination elements is deciding whether or not you're going to grant an appraisal waiver. Uh, which Fannie and Freddie, so that would pick up that movement by Fannie and Freddie when they grant an appraisal waiver. And it would require you know, those mortgage originators and secondary market issues that engage in these, again, defined terms, credit decisions or covered security determinations to have basically quality controls in place to ensure various factors are met with the AVMs. Now here I mentioned the last item is the most important relating to this topic. The first four items, ensure a high level of confidence in the estimates produced, protect against the manipulation of data, avoid conflicts of interest, require random sample testing reviews, that was in Dodd-Frank. Dodd-Frank gave the agencies the ability to add additional factors. They added the fifth factor, comply with applicable non-discrimination laws. In the preamble they note that while there may be an ability for AVMs to remove bias. There could be bias baked in. They could be, the system may have in it appraisals themselves that were biased, or in the writing of the algorithm, bias could have taken, uh, been a factor in that. So they realized the potential for AVMs to help provide for better and more accurate valuations, but there's a need to check them to make sure neither the data in them is biased and the system itself is not designed in a biased manner. So again, uh, t June 21, it will appear in the Federal Register and we'll have to August 20th to get in comments on that. Let's move on to the next uh, item. And uh, Fair uh, Housing Finance Agency, uh, looked, you know, we have Fannie and Freddie requires that you submit information into this uniform appraisal data set. It is a very robust data set, has information on a lot of appraisals in there. They looked at 2021 data and they wanted to see what can we find and what they decided to do is let's, let's look at undervaluations in different census tracts. And what they define an undervaluation as is the appraisal comes in less than the contract sale price. Now, we know in 2021 what was going on with home prices and gotcha. appraisers were having a hard time keeping up with the ever escalating uh, market at, for homes. So that it was a bit of a trying period, but they applied the same definition equally. So, you know, and so by applying it equally, we can see there are differences. What they did is let's look at white census tracts where whites comprise over 50%, minority tracts where minorities comprise just over 50 to 80 percent or high minority tracts where minorities comprise over 80 percent. Those are standard definitions used by the federal government when it does fair lending analyses. So let's see what they found on the next slide as charts in terms of the rates of undervaluation. There were 13.4 percent in white tracts, 19.2 in minority, and 23.3 in high minority tracts. So clearly difference Doing the math a little differently in the high minority tracks, 74% greater chance of an undervaluation. Minority tracks, 43% greater chance of an undervaluation than white tracks. What they really say is this is a robust database, and in getting at the root causes and the extent of appraisal bias, we could probably use this database, and it is available to members of the public lenders. You can go in and see different data by different areas and check that, and that's probably, I, I'm gonna suggest that uh, Regulators may expect lenders to start doing these analyses themselves. Now, let's look at the last, uh, I think this will be the last item we cover on the next slide. Oh, no, next slide. Uh, this is a case in Maryland dealing with appraisal bias where a uh, house uh, owned by individuals who are black, they had it appraised, came in at 472000 
which was a sale price of another home in the neighborhood, but this home was considerably different. Got a white friend involved. They did. The, they whitewashed the house. Had it presented as owned by a white individual, a seven hundred and fifty thousand dollar appraisal. That's, that's yeah, just stark stark difference there. Uh, they say they advise the lender, hey, this this initial appraisal you got is discriminatory, uh, and they said the lender then retaliated by cease, not only denying a loan but ceasing communications. Now the bureau. CFPB and DOJ filed a statement of interest. And that's next slide. You can see the three things they made, and it's the middle one. It's interesting. One thing is what's the pleading standard? The lenders are arguing they have to basically plead a prima facie case uh, and allege direct uh, evidence of discriminatory intent. And the Bureau and DOJ say, no, that's at the summary judgment stage. This is at the motion to dismiss stage. All the plaintiff has to do is plead sufficient facts to establish a plausible allegation of discriminatory conduct. It's the second item here I really want to focus on. A lender violates the Equal Credit Opportunity Act and Fair Housing Act when it relies on an appraisal that it knows is discriminatory or more importantly should know. And that's where Jeff's going to help give us some pointers later on things that might point out to when you should say, hey, I've got some issues with this appraisal here. Uh, and the other thing they deny, the, the lender said, hey, you know, they claimed retaliation, but you could only est establish a retaliation claim under the Fair Housing Act if you show an underlying violation of the Fair Housing Act. And the Bureau and DOJ say, no, uh, it's the government position that retaliation is a separate claim. Uh, you can violate that itself without an underlying violation. And I think they're right in that position uh, under the Fair Housing Act. Now let's go on to the next item. And this is, uh, it goes into some complaints, but I think what's most helpful is, is the NCRC, National Community Reinvestment Coalition. I, I think we're thoughtful in this report and coming up with ways to get at appraisal bias. Uh, what they did is they ended up under the Fair Housing Act, private uh, groups or individuals can file complaints and we do see community groups filing complaints and they filed two complaints under the Fair Housing Act when that's filed with HUD. Uh, and it addressed, one addressed uh, poor service given to a black individual and a white, or undervaluation based on being black as opposed to white. So two different appraisers in, in a group of tests conducted in the Baltimore, Maryland area in 21 uh, and 22. And what they did is they had couples where one spouse was black, one spouse was white. So it was easy to present the house as being black owned or white owned to different appraisers and see what the different results were. And let's look on the next page what the different uh, results were. And one involved service. They hired an appraiser first to appraise a house presented as being owned by a black individual. Uh, took 75 days. During this time, they were tried to reach the appraiser, radio silence, cr complete crickets, and the appraisal just shows up 75 days later. Hire the same appraiser to appraise a house presented as being owned by a white individual, 17 days, and the week before, appraiser voluntarily calls up the homeowner and says, hey, I'll have it for you next week. And uh, so there was a complaint there. Now, the interesting thing is the appraiser who took so long to deliver the appraisal when presented home presented as being owned by black, actually valued it $5,000 higher than when the same home was presented as being owned by a white and reviewed by another appraiser. So interesting countervailing factor there. Second complaint deals with valuation, hired an appraiser, presented a home as owned by a black individual, value comes in at 310. Other valuations presented as black or white owned between 350 and 380. Take the same appraiser who came in with the low, the low appraisal, present a different home was owned by a white, comes with a 553,000 valuation, other valuations between 765.10. The NCRC is this appraiser is clearly taking race into account and coming in low or coming in high. Now, interestingly, when you add up all the valuations of all the tests they conducted, there wasn't that much difference in total. And in actually a number of the tests, the home uh, when presented as owned by a black individual was higher. So the results weren't as stark as we others so sometimes see, but the, ser the service one in particular really stands out to me. That's, that's how do you say 75 days to deliver the results of the appraisal? But what I thought was most interesting is their recommendations. And that's on my last slide where we have their recommendations. And Jeff's actually gonna to touch on some of this as well. Let's just do more testing of appraisers. If when you know someone's minding the store, uh, you tend to act differently. Let's make the appraisal industry more diverse. I see different numbers here. The one the NCRC cited was at 97.7 appraisers are, are white, which is 
it's mind boggling and nearly 70% are men. And we you need to get more diversity in the appraisal industry. There's no question about that. We'll require them like under the Home Mortgage Disclosure Act, we have government monitoring information. They're saying we need that for appraisers as well. Let's, let's create a reporting system for that. Me, here, reconsideration of appraisals or reconsideration of value. Let's have a meaningful process. Fair lending training. I know that's something the federal government has made comments to the appraisal standards board. Hey, you don't have enough fair lending information and training in here. Increase funding for enforcement. And this, how, let's have some industry standards that we could all point to to make sure the appraisals are fair. So I thought actually this was quite good by the NCRC. They were very thoughtful in what they did. Now, I've presented a lot of the issues, but helpful suggestions of how you can address some of these issues. And that's where Jeff is going to take it over. Jeff? All right. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. That I, that was information I hadn't heard. So I appreciate you uh, putting that together. Very, very informative. So um, I think we uh, we do have uh, a groundwork and we do um, thankful to the people on the PAVE committee and and the administration for bringing attention to this. I think it's something that's kind of been kind of, you know, kicked down the road and, and pushed under the rug. And, and, and now I think uh, because of uh, where we are in, in in society, we're addressing some of these things. So I'm excited about that. And by the way, I'm part of that. Uh, what is that? Three percent. Three percent appraisers. Uh, that's not white. So uh, yeah, that that is pretty um, accurate as far as my experience with you know in this profession, 30 plus years. There's not a lot of diversity in it, but I just accepted that's just how it is. So, but but it's nice that's that we're looking at that as well. I think that mm -hmm. does play a role in how. Uh, appraisals and valuations are are done. Um, obviously, if you are someone who is from or lives in one of these minority communities, you generally don't have the same um, thoughts about the people there or about the neighborhoods as someone who's from outside. So I think there's some benefits there. Not to say necessarily the value is going to be higher all the time, but I think there's at least an understanding and, and a comfort level that you get when you are from that area, like myself, um, I come and grew up, grew up in, in South Central and Los Angeles County. Um, when I was high school, we moved to Orange County, which is a cultural shock to me <laughs> coming from LA. But um, but that you know that kind of is kind of a, uh, explains how people and I got to hear different perspectives on things when I moved to Orange County. There's been a lot of black people there. So I got to hear that perspective and actually offer some some insight as well as an appraiser who's appraised everything from um, South Central LA to uh, Beverly Hills, Bel Air, Brentwood, you know, Malibu have done all that over my career. And so I got a uh, I got a good depth of knowledge of all those kinds of properties. So okay, let's get into the slides here. We've got about 30 minutes. So I'll take a few minutes to go through this. So, so um, I have a slide here about um, reconsideration of values or ROV. So, you know, as someone who's actually helped to put together a policy, my last bank had helped to put together our ROV policy because we didn't have one. Um, I think it's important that it is, and, and I'm, I'm putting my appraiser hat now. I think it's important that the process is 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 fair. It's somewhat fast, and it's and it gives the oh my light went out of my office. Um, Got to move around more. So um, I think it gives the the appraiser and it gives the lender um, and the homeowner probably the best opportunity to have success if there's potential undervaluation or overvaluation. Are generally going to be a situation where they're going to complain about undervaluation in most cases. Most people won't complain if it's too high, but assuming most situations where it's going to be a case of undervaluation, um, we, we put some of these things in place. You can, you know, I, I'll make this available to you um, as you put together your ROV uh, process. Um, think about some of these things, for example, the number of sales provided. So we, as an appraiser, you don't want to see someone give the appraiser, you know, 20 sales out of public records or something like that. That just makes the appraiser go, forget, it, I'm not even going to look at this. Um, but if you give something, you know, two to four, that's probably ideal. That lets the appraiser address each one if they maybe have to go back out to the property or if they... Um, need to look more depth in depth into those sales. They have the ability to do that and address that in the appraisal. Um, the other one is to review the appraisal before you even send a reconsideration of and send new sales. 
review the appraisal and verify that none of your new sales are in the current appraisal report. I know that's common sense, but you'd be surprised how often you get a reconsideration and they send you the sales you've already put in the appraisal. That's my sale one. That's my sale two. So um, make sure you take that time. And th this is extra work. I, I admit it. I mean, you want to just obviously just get the information, send it out and have the appraiser do, do all the work. But that creates resentment and it creates somebody who's probably going to take a, a more of a hardcore stance on their original value. Um, when you see somebody that took the time to actually put into analyzing the, the sales, analyzing what was already in the appraisal, um, it's important. So the next one I have in here is make sure that the new sales support a higher value if that's what they're going for. Sometimes you get sales where if I include those sales, my sale, my, sale, my appraisal is going to be lower than it is right now. So they don't even support a higher value. So I know these are common sense things, but these are just quick things you want to check on the front end on a reconsideration in, as you put together your policy. And then this is a tougher one because you want to review the sales to see if they are, quote, un, better, unquote, than the original report, sales in the original report. So what I mean by better is more proximate location. So for example, if the appraiser used sales that are, you know, half a block, ha half a mile away or a few blocks away, and then you're presenting sales that are a mile or two miles away, that's probably not going to be something the appraisers want to consider, even if the value is higher, because it's like, why well, didn't use those? Because that's a different neighborhood or a different location. Um, the other things are uh, property characteristics. And that's why it's better when you when you put together your ROV process you have it like in a grid form, like that represents kind of like a sales grid that you'd see on, a, on an appraisal um, appraisal report, because then you can see those comparisons and you don't have to go through each item, each line that's on an appraisal, but some of the major things like GLA, room count, bedroom count, those are good and maybe pool or something like that, because that gives you, before you even send it to the appraiser, some idea of how comparable these sales are if they're even worth sending to the to the appraiser and, and, and you know so so things like gross living area right so your gross living area in your reconsideration of value sales should be similar or maybe could be slightly higher or slightly lower but they shouldn't be twice as big you know for example i'm, I'm using extremes here same with bedrooms uh, lot size all those kinds of things and then features so if you are a subject property that does have a, a view, then obviously sales without a view were used. That's probably a, situ a situation. Say, hey, this appraisal, this these the subject had a view, and vice versa. All this, all the comparables have a view, and the subject does not. There's probably a reason that appraiser didn't use those. And I use, I threw out some other things like pool and guest house and all those things. So those are just some quick kind of things to think about if you're putting together a ROV process um, that you want your, and it helps your borrower to understand what's going on. You have to unfortunately educate the borrower to the process because as you know, the appraisal is not really written for the borrower. So a lot of the things in the appraisal don't make sense to a borrower because they don't read those every day like we do. And that's why in the appraisal, you actually have to identify as part of USPAP, which is the appraisal standard is the intended use and the intended user. And most of the time that's gonna be the lender, not so much so, even though the borrower pays for it, it's kind of interesting dynamic that the borrower does pay for it, but they're not the intended user of that, it's, it's the lender. So that requires, and I, and I am an advocate for educating borrowers in, in, in appraisal so that they understand what they're looking at and understand what is a comparable. And a lot of times you're on the front line, you're dealing with that borrower, um, you're the one that, you know, they have their trust in, you're the one that took their application, you're the one that have a relationship with them. So Sometimes that means taking that extra step to educate them on the appraisal process and what it means to what comparables are. Every sale is not a comparable. Their sale, that's why I put sales and not comparables, because comparables have a specific definition related to just the just the definition of a, it's comparable to the subject property. So that's where you as a lender would have to become more aware of. Uh, what is a comparable? And that's why I kind of gave these tips here to kind of give you an idea of comparing a sale which is just a property that's sold versus a comparable. Okay, uh, you can go to the next slide here. Okay, so um, so Rich has already talked about appraisal diversity, and I'm, I'm, I, 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 there's a slide here I probably should have put in here. So before I get into PAVE and what that's all about and some of the suggestions of PAVE, um, one of the things that's, and, and Richard brought this up, is a, a hot topic is AVMs. So um, our company, um, Veros, is one of many that 
that does produce a professional grade AVM that is used by lenders for um, mortgage lending purposes for uh, analysis of portfolios and those kinds of things. So we are very, very, we've been involved in, in AVM since the beginning, 20 years ago or so. So, um, but I do want to take a quick note and say that um, all AVMs are not equal. So without calling out any specific AVMs, um, certain AVMs are designed for professional use, meaning they have a confidence score, they have metrics in there that are measured and and actually on a like like ours and others are measured and 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 used and compared to data used by uh, lenders. Uh, large banks will 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 put four or five AVMs together, blind studies, and we do it on a, on a regular basis. Where our AVM is one of probably ten or so that are tested for accuracy. And accuracy is really how close was that AVM value to the um, sale price before the sale was listed on the market. So obviously after it's sold, clearly you're gonna say, well, of course you got it right. It was already sold, but these AVMs, if they're tested properly, are done prior to that. And the key part, comparing a professional to a, what I call a consumer grade AVM, which is what you can see online for free, you know, you know all the different ones that you can get, um, but those are built really for the purpose of really drawing business, whether it's you advertising on these sites or a, a, a realtor advertising on these sites. And, you know, they have their goal is really to just put a value on every property, regardless of the um, accuracy or not, not say accuracy, regardless of the confidence score. So, so a low confidence score, for example, I'm using a number of one to a hundred. If you have an 80 confidence score, that's not great. If you have a 90, 95% confidence score, that means we believe there's a there's about a 90% chance or so that that value is going to line up with that actual appraised value or with that property value compared to the sale price. So anyway, got too much in the weeds there, but I just want to make some comments because we're going to talk about AVMs and and Richard brought up there is a uh, proposal to analyze AVMs. We we actually have studied and compared our AVM to um in markets we have a we did a very in-depth study on avm on our avm and you can get that um anywhere in fact i'll make that available uh uh to you to look at how our avm conforms in minority communities compared to majority white communities and the the summary of that was after adjusting for all the market differences and so forth there was no uh difference in how it performed and that when i say how it performed did it did it overvalue for example in a white community did it undervalue like we looked at some of these appraisers did it undervalue in minority communities and we didn't find that we found that was pretty consistent and it makes sense if you think about the fact that an avm doesn't know the demographics of the community right and so the question was about the baked in is there baked in uh kind of um metrics that favor one neighborhood over another and i think you know speaking for our avm we didn't find that so so which 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 is important because we're going to get into some of these recommendations and i think that that plays in there but you got to make sure your data like we talked about is accurate uh relevant and is 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 um supported so even as an appraiser whether it's an avm or, or an appraisal the the data or the adjustments that you make and that that the appraiser makes should be supported and it should really have analytics behind it because when i started you could just say that i just appraised i came up with these adjustments based on my knowledge of the area <laughs> that's all i had to say so i didn't have to really provide a lot of support but nowadays when you are thinking about a bias claim or a possible lawsuit, it's important for the appraiser and the lender to have uh, confidence in the appraisal or the AVM to make sure that there's no bias in there and that that wasn't a factor. Okay, so most of you are familiar with PAVE and uh, there's a lot of recommendations here. One of them obviously was about diversity as well as and they actually recommended more use of AVMs because AVM can be a third party resource uh, for a lender, even for an appraiser. You know, I tell appraisers all the time, if if the AVM supports your value and the AVM doesn't know the race, doesn't went, what, didn't go inside the property, didn't know it was whitewashed, whitewashed or anything like that, and is somewhat within a certain reasonable, you know, percentage of your appraisal, that's good. That's not a bad thing. So I think appraisers a lot of times are afraid of AVMs, but I think AVMs can be uh, uh, beneficial to everybody in the industry because of that data and analytics that goes into an AVM and consider so many other metrics that the typical appraiser generally doesn't have 
access to and doesn't have time to, as opposed to 10 or 20 sales that appraiser may initially consider, an AVM may take 100 or 200 sales from that neighborhood and do a lot of different metrics on that. So, um, so I'm gonna talk more about some of our solutions related to this diversity issue. That's our, that's our topic, that's our group. So let's go to the next slide. Um, so one of the things that we found, and this was actually in the uh, uh, recent, well, actually two years ago, the Fannie Mae guideline, they talked about problematic terms or potentially biased terms. Now, does this mean the appraiser is racist or biased? Not necessarily, because a lot of these terms I was using because that's how I was trained. So as you as you evolve and as you realize that some of these terms and some of these things can be code words for bias, that we have to be better about being uh, more uh, ob objective and, and less subjective with our language. So this is just right out of the Fannie Mae uh, handbook, um, Praiser handbook from June of 2021. It talks about words like desirable neighborhood, crime-rich neighborhood, affordable neighborhood, integrated community. It's all terms that could indicate something related to the demographic. So desirable neighborhood is a very subjective term, um, and it's depends on who's the person that's calling it desirable, right? I may consider a desirable neighborhood different from what another person may consider desirable. But in, if that term is used and there's no data behind it and there's no um, subjective things, like for example, they're talking about objective language like list the neighborhood amenities, for example, of this of this neighborhood. What, you know, there, there's a new neighborhood swimming pool. They gave that example. So you can list things that are factual about a neighborhood without using the word desirable, which did, which is subjective and, and could potentially be biased, especially if we're talking about a, a, a majority white neighborhood and you, the opposite goes for a black neighborhood and you say it's undesirable, right? What makes it undesirable? So crime written neighborhood, you know, that's another kind of touchy one there um, because what is a crime written neighborhood? So for example, they use the example that the crime rate in this neighborhood is X. So Still not sure if that's totally relevant, but you know, it 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 because it does create a certain image in an underwriter's mind, in a lender's mind about that neighborhood when you see that word. Um, maybe there's other things that can be said, but that's an example. At least if you're saying that, you're using an actual statistical fact versus just saying it's crime written. Uh, affordable neighborhood, um, another word that can mean different things to different people. So instead of saying affordable neighborhood, you could say whether the property is aligned with the price range of the neighborhood. What is the price range of there? Which is already part of the appraisal. At the top of the appraisal, it, in the neighborhood section, it talks about the range of price range, the price range. And if you're outside of that, you don't have to say it's an affordable neighborhood. You can just say it's outside of the range of what's typical for that neighborhood based on my analysis. Um, integrated neighborhood, again. What does that mean? That could mean a lot of different, you know, demographic, uh, racial components. It can mean a certain age. It can mean a certain uh, orientation. It can mean a lot of different things, right? And a lot of people, oh, that's great. It's integrated, but that could have a negative connotation. So this is what appraisers are having to address in their training in California, for example. Angela Jamon, who's our state uh, state of California czar of real estate appraisal, which I'm friends with. She, we, you know, we've talked about this and California is one of the states that is requiring additional training on bias and sensitivity when you're going out because California is probably one of the most diverse, you know, states in the country, right? So, and as California goes, so goes the nation, some people say. So hopefully um, as appraisers can learn how to avoid um, subjective, um, pr problematic language, it will, it will lessen the um, potential for it to be, for there to be a claim of bias. Because even if the value comes in at the value, if you're using terms that are, that are somewhat problematic or potentially biased, that's not good. That's not good for the appraiser, especially if that appraiser has a pattern. So a lot of this is education. So we are in the process as, a, as an industry, as a profession of educating our our appraisal brethren and, and helping them come along. And I think most, for the most part, most appraisers do not want to be accused of bias. They don't want to be associated with bias. I mean, most people in general, right? But you do have these um, uh, underlying terms that um, most people don't realize potentially are biased. So we're working with that. We actually have a bias word search as part of one of our products that we allow, uh, we work with um, we work. We work with Fannie and Freddie, FHA, VA. We are the. If you don't, if you don't know Veros, so get a little background on Veros. We are actually the the data provider, and we're actually the ones that actually 
produce uh, UCDP and CU for them. They we, we store all the appraisals that come through those those channels and provide that information um, that they use for them. So, so we're very familiar with this topic and very familiar with how this needs to be dealt with. And I think things are happening in a positive way. I, I'm really encouraged by what I'm seeing in the committees and things that I'm involved in. And I know it's taking, uh, it's having an impact. And I think as somebody who's black, I think, you know, there's a, there is a certain level of um, uh, apprehension uh, when someone who's not of your community is appraising in your neighborhood. I mean, there's that's just natural. You feel like I'm not going to get a fair deal. I'm not going to get a fair shake. And I think as you see more of these issues, as well as adding diversity to the profession, that's going to just make it a lot uh, a lessen a lot of potential claims because I, if the persons in my neighborhood and in my community or knows my community or uh, looks like me, for example, um, I'm less likely to feel that person is going is going to be biased and I have to take down all my photos and all this, you know, have a white person stand in and all that kind of stuff. So, um, so we're working on that. And so we can go to the next slide. So this is what some of the things that Richard mentioned. And again, these numbers vary depending on who you ask, you know, 90 to 97, 70 are uh, white, 70, 70 percent are male. Um, Jim Park, who's the, who's the head of the appraisal subcommittee, mentions that, yes, we all have implicit bias based on our background. I have it, you have it, and we all have it because of we're, we're, we're raised a certain way and we have certain beliefs about certain people. And if we don't have any relationship with them or haven't associated with them, we keep those things. And media kind of uh, uh, kind of keeps fueling that fire about that. So that's why it's important that we, um, again, diverse, uh, diversify the industry. So um, this also talked about 4.2% more of the appraisal values were lower than the contract price in white versus black neighborhoods and richard did a good job of going into that uh, so we're all pretty much aware of the the issues okay you can go to the next slide um and this is just more information about the the, the profession so the average age of the appraisers right now is about 59 60 years old um, which is not good. We don't have a lot of new people come in. 3% of the appraisers are leaving versus 1% that are being added. So you see that the math there is not good. So in addition to the diversity issue, we still have an issue of uh, a lack of appraisers coming in profession. And a lot of that has to do with barriers to entry. And uh, the profession and uh, that I'm a part of um, is has been very uh, exclusive and very made it very difficult for somebody to become an appraiser, regardless of race, but particularly if you're a minority, because we're going to get into some of the requirements. Um, one of the things is it requires you to have at, at least a, about a year of education, but also about another year of supervised training. So you can't even take the test in California, in most states, not just California, you can't take the test for the exam, even if you've done the education, unless you've worked under somebody in like an apprentice situation for uh, 1,000 to 1,500 hours. So that is a big barrier to entry that needs to be addressed because I can go get a law degree, pass the bar and open up my, my law, you know, put up my shingle the next day and start practicing any kind of law, so I want. So um, this is a this is not a, a lending situation. This is more the profession itself, and there are things there are there are proposals underway to to change this. Um, there's a program called Perea, which is a automated version of the training where appraisers can instead of having to get a supervisor, they can they can try to go in and take the classes online. And you know that that's a that, that hasn't been proven yet. This is a proposal that they're talking about. But right now, um, I I speak to um, there's a there's a um, there's a program called the Appraisal Diversity Initiative with this that's part sponsored by the F Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, and the Urban League. And what that does is allows appraisers to come into the profession, makes them aware of the profession. They can get cl um, classes, and then they can you know, uh, start the process, but they can't get their license because they have to get a supervisor. So there's no supervisor program. So, okay, go to the next slide. Kind of running over time here, sorry. I think I have one more slide. So we have what's called our Valigent Appraisal Training Program, company I work with, Valigent. Um, we are looking for a partnership with lenders. And what we do is we will bring in a trainee, train them, teach them everything they need to learn to pass the exam. And hopefully they either continue to work with Valgen or they can go work for themselves or work for someone else, but at least they get this, this big, you know, monster wall of barrier out of the way uh, with someone who's 
tr who's training them with the newest technology, using analytics, using data, um, pre preparing professional appraisals in the current using current technology. Um, we're we're looking for lenders to help us out. Uh, we have I have. In our program, we have something like 30 trainees that are ready to go. We have something like 10 trainers. We pay the trainer and the trainee um, in exchange for these orders. So you, as a lender, would not have to come out of pocket. You would just supply a number of orders, and then those orders would be used to hire a full-time trainee and a part or full-time trainer. Okay? I think that's it. Is there another slide? Okay, so we have a goal to train um, 100 new appraisers um, across the country over the next 24 months. It's an aggressive goal. Uh, we are coordinating. We are part of the, the uh, Fannie and Freddie initiative. Um, and we do, uh, again, look for ways to increase technology, increase diversity, because if you increase diversity and increase technology, you'll have better outcomes with those appraisals and probably eliminate a lot of these potential pitfalls with uh, appraisers that are outside of the neighborhood and maybe don't understand these communities and maybe don't have the same um, views about even things like adjustments, which could be impactful to how you appraise a property if you have a, a, a preset perception about a certain group. So I think that's it for me. Okay. Thank you, Bridge and Jeff, that was great. Um, we do have a few minutes left. If you, anybody has any questions, you should see a Q&A dialog box on your um, control panel. So if you have any questions for our presenters, feel free to submit those now. I'm gonna see if we have Hennemi come in real quick. Okay, we've got one that's come in. How many US appraisers have been convicted of violating the law by submitting low appraisals based upon race during the last, say, 10 years? Not sure if either of you have that information. <laughs> want to speak to it at all yeah i haven't heard of any enforcement actions i know there are some complaints that have been filed with uh, hud under the fair housing act where they've and they often file against the appraiser and the lender and we don't have any you know resolutions of those yet and usually the way they're resolved is, is either hud determines there's no reasonable cause doesn't file a charge uh, the matters may conciliate and that is public when they do conciliate they they release those publicly uh, or they don't conciliate but they think there's a reasonable charge so they file a charge and then you're you're heading to administrative court and then you could end up in the regular courts uh, and that's that's public as as well but uh, they take time to process uh, and hud is not the fastest moving agency as i noted before yeah, and, and I would I would like to add to that. Um, that is a good question. I think what we're seeing right now is, and I can speak for people in my community, a lot of them that I've spoken with don't even know anything about a reconsideration process or appealing an appraisal. They just take whatever value they get. They complain about it, but they say, you know, they 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 feel like that's that's the best option they have. And I've heard stories of them telling me they've known of other sales that were higher, and the lender just says, you know, basically take it or leave it, you know. And and they they a lot of times don't have the option or, or the education to even present a a viable complaint or a reconsideration request. Um, a lot of time that education is not in the the African American community or minority communities, whereas other people know if this isn't right, I'm a complaint. So. Um, so the, the the fact that the claims have not been you know prevalent at this point is not really an indication of the fact that there's potential issues that 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 are that I think will become addressed as as more of this information becomes uh, available to people in these communities. I think you'll see an uptick, and I know there is an uptick in complaints coming through now um, because of the knowledge of the fact that they have either 800 number, I think FHA has an 800 number. Um, some of these other, some of these other organizations are putting out numbers. Um, CFPB and others are making this knowledge, making this information aware. So I think that's where we're headed. Well, you okay, know, we've had one other question that's come in. Oh, sorry, Rosalyn. No, go ahead, please. Can you become a licensed appraiser in another state and then apply that license to California, or will the state make you go through the entire licensing process again? It depends. And California and most states now have reciprocal agreements. So you can come in 
I think you have to stay, I think the way it works, works right now in our state, you have to take what's called laws and regs, which are state, local laws and regs. You have to pass it, which is not that difficult. Uh, and then you can practice in California and vice versa. Most most states have reciprocal agreements. With some, some you just sign on, you automatically get it, and others may take you take some small uh, class to learn the laws and regs of that state. But it's, it's yeah, it's pretty easy to do that. So basically, you're saying that you can be an appraiser in all 50 states? <laughs> That's pretty hard to do <laughs> because there's there's this aspect of geographic competency that you'd pretty hard it'd be pretty hard for you to prove that I am geographically competent in 50 states. Let, look, let's just talk about counties, right? So I can be I, I have a license in California and I live in Southern California. I can't say I'm geographically competent in Northern California, you know, just because I if and I actually have appraised there, but there are a lot of appraisers that have not. So um, it's 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 even smaller than than state. You have to know and prove that you know that neighborhood and you know that area. So those are those are those are some big um, uh, uh, shoes to fill to say that I can I can appraise in fifty states. <laughs> okay. Just wanted to answer that question right quick. Samantha, do we have any other questions? That was the last one, I believe. That's coming. Okay. Well, then we have certainly come up to our. 12 o'clock hour. Thank you so much, Rich, and for Jeff for this information. And given how this issue is moving so quickly and so aggressively through the system, we may have to do a part three for you all just to update <laughs> you on what's going on because we've got a lot of things that are in proposed comment area that are rulemaking areas, and everybody's trying to fill around with how they're going to address this issue. And We've got a new acronym that we love in this industry called ROVE, Reconsideration of Value, and everybody's going to get to know that one. And so I encourage you once again to please visit. I think, Samantha, these um, PowerPoint presentations are going to be available on the Cal The recording MBA. of the part of the presentation will be available on our DEI committee page, the CMBA.com oh. website. Okay, perfect. And I would encourage you to take advantage of that once again. Anyone that wants to join our committee, we welcome you. We welcome the insight. We continue to go forth and try to provide the industry with all the information and resources that we can possibly get through ourselves for you to help you to do your business better, to help you avoid these pitfalls, and to help us get this right in this industry as it relates to our praise and bias. Samantha and everyone, thank you so very much for joining us and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you, Rich and Jeff. We appreciate Thank you guys. You. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Rosalind. Have a good one. All right. Bye. Have a great rest of your day, everybody. All right.